Are you planning to go international to pitch it? We did uh, already in, in Barcelona. Have you applied to ITFA, for instance? So Maria has been to Barcelona, yeah. the pitching forum. I have been to Cross Media Days in Paris, which is specifically transmedia and cross media pitching. And we did apply for IDFA, waiting for the answer now. Uh, you applied to ITFA? For the pitching forum, yeah. Good, good. Yeah, so I waiting for the I answer. Think, I think you will go in. Hopefully. <laughs> Maybe we should explain that in, in Amsterdam in November, the biggest, you know, probably the, the, the biggest documentary festival in the world. But two years ago, they started uh, having transmedia projects for the financing forum. Uh, and that's what you have applied, right? So that's a that's a, 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 a huge window into the international financing world for transmedia projects, right? And I think I can uh, make some make some input here because Kaspar, who runs DocLab, he's uh, I mean he's amazingly keen on every new form of media. But I met Kaspar when we were both invited for the WordPress Photo brainstorming forum when we were working on the new rules for the WordPress Photo multimedia contest where the WordPress of the guys felt it's essential to bring somebody from the filmmaking side. And then he went on and he was the jury, in the jury of the WordPress photo to last year. And this is where these two markets actually do cross, and that's where people can collaborate from both sides and make uh, you know mutual input. And I think that's very important to not just define yourself at this moment. You know, are you a photographer? Are you a filmmaker? Are you a multimedia producer? Uh, we, we all can share the experience. So it's not only cross media, it's also cross people. And yes. that's quite yes. important, right? Yeah, a question here? Patif Alexander. Alexander Patif. From 90 till 90, uh, uh, 95, I, I was a part of the authority in this city. I know. I know everyone from Leningrad and from Saint Petersburg. Uh, politicians from Leningrad, both and Saint Petersburg, who now are in Moscow, including Putin. I was standing. Uh, I was thinking about in in the rallies on Nevsky against the Chechen war, the rallies that were organized by the um, Memorial Foundation. When I was in in this uh, rally, I was approached by one guy who who served in Chechnya as a, as a military. As a, mili as a military, uh, uh, and he swore at us. I, I pulled, out, pulled out my knife, and and the guy went away. And the guy returned with 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 police uh, and asked me to to, to show uh, to show my knife. Where is your knife? And I pulled it out again, and I said, "It's always uh, 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 always with me to to, to to cut sausage." And the the young man answered, uh, "I'll just pull pull out my my gun and we'll shoot you." But since it was on Nevsky Prospect, he just disappeared. So I'm very happy, very to see a Russian documentary on this topic because I, me personally, I know the uh, head of of Chechen community in Russia. We we have been cooperating from 1996 with him and and uh, genuine truth in documentary in Chechnya. Uh, I saw only in in Litvikov festival only in the framework of message to men, but that were films by European uh, masters. Six years ago, there was a a film a documentary uh, made by by Netherlanders uh, featuring a uh, a bus uh, that was traveling from Chechnya to Krasnodar. W one one girl f felt sick, uh, and the, 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 he the head of the group who came at the, at the block, block post uh, came uh, came out to, to the doctor, uh, as a military doctor, and the girl and the girl, the little girl said, y y "Please don't let this uh, Russian adult man touch me." So. Uh, 
but, but actually to be to be honest people in Chechnya hate Russians just hate openly this is the outcome of two Chechen wars uh, unlike the United States we, we didn't win there just as America didn't win in Vietnam but um, America left left Vietnam and uh, reformed its army and the outcome of the Vietnam War is known in the US thank you and who is the next one to raise a hand in the audience Nobody wants to. There are many films on, on, on Chechnya. There's also the uh, Belarusian director Yuri Kachavatsky, who was there some years ago, who made a very strong film, I remember. It was all, almost unbearable to watch it. And um, should we move on to, to, uh, to Tanya, maybe, I think? Wish you luck in Amsterdam if you are selected, but. It would, it would um, be surprising if not, just to give you a little <laughs> optimism. Uh, funding, I mean this example of yours, when you are showing all the logos, I mean it's a classical funding, isn't it? Are there some new possibilities, Tanya? Are you, as the most important, strongest company in, in Germany, in web documentaries, etc., are you seeing some new possibilities in Europe? Um, it is not really easy to fund this new cross-media project. Uh, what we find out is that there is... Um, possibilities to change regulations at the recent uh, fundings in Germany, for example. So we talk with them and we ask also why, why there is no option for cross-media. Um, what we also started is to go to different markets. So with an upcoming project, Vikings, it's going to be a serious game and a two-part documentary. We uh, want to launch this uh, serious game in, on the educational market. So we stopped thinking about how can we finance, finance this part of the project with a film fund. We try to get to this new option of, okay, how, where games are funded? Where do, does, does the game industry get the money from? Or where does the, um, where is money for, for web stuff? Where is money for tablets? Who could be a partner and who could be engaged that they maybe raise money? What we also did um, is to make a partnership with the programming agency. So um, we as a company, as well as they as a company, we go in a financial risk. I mean, for us it's possible because the film stuff is the basic work what we're doing. Um, but I would say it's 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 about opening um, the mind to think about where is money and also go to the ministry and ask on the specific department if there is maybe a supporting level. Um, what we haven't really found out is uh, business models, how they work afterwards when the project's done, if, if, they, if the project pays itself, for example, the app. Um, I would not say that uh, you earn a lot of money with apps. I would say it's such a trust, uh, short percentage, like 5% of app developers really uh, get money out of it. How, how, how do you get money from an app? How is, how, just well, tell us the basics. It depends on the, on the business model. Um, we, for example, the Wagner Files is a paid app, so you go to the app store and to really get access to the app and to download the app, you need to pay. And there is also the way of uh, in-app purchase. It means you get the app for free, you have a look at, you get a preview. Um, for example, when you have a book, you get the uh, first chapter for free. But then, uh, if you want to continue reading or want to get more chapters or access to more content uh, or different levels, you need to buy it. And this is what's upcoming, actually, that uh, people Oh, that the developers put the app for free, but then when you engage the people and when they really, when you have their interest, they also are willing to pay more. But it's still 
in um, pro work in progress. And you as a production company, you get a percentage of the amount that people have to pay to download the app. Yes. How does it work? Yeah. So, um, for example, our app costs five euros. Um, we get 70% from this salary. 13% uh, goes to the App Store, to Apple, and the, the rest, how much is it? 17? Um, it goes to the credit card holder. That's the crazy thing. So, yeah. But you as a company, you earn 70% of an app. Just going back to to you again, Olga. Just maybe I missed it. Is there any possibility, not for your project, but in general? I can also ask here to get funding for web documentaries from the Ministry of Culture in Russia. Has has anyone tried? You were talking about it yesterday. Have you tried that? Or oh, anyone else here? Do you know anything about it? Me personally, I haven't tried this way because I'm, uh, I'm uh, involved in civil rights projects and I believe in today's current political situation uh, our government will just, will just uh, throw me out if I approach them with this request. It's, but it's my, my personal experience, my personal feeling, my personal belief. I, I don't think in, in, current, in, in current political situation it would be worth trying trying it at all. You know, as far as cooperation with the Minister of Culture is concerned, uh, we as documentarians have had a uh, sad experience. Any financial cooperation with the Minister of Culture starts with, uh, with the fact that the Minister of Culture, who is supposedly can, can, uh, can award some grant, they re request that you put some money on their account, uh, so, but, which you startup or smaller companies don't have and in in independent uh, uh, documentaries or startup companies they are just uh, excluded and this is a result of um, of lobbying from huge TV broadcasters who can put some um, some money on the uh, bank account of the ministry and then get the, the money back so this scheme on financial cooperation that supposedly allegedly uh, uh, protects uh, uh, our industry it doesn't work actually it's, it's good that, that you uh, that you uh, can come back to Olga uh, we started talking with Tatiana but still I, I, as an afterthought please tell me the project that you are preparing which is its primary message what are you going to uh, to say new about Chechnya uh, from your present presentation I, I I get understanding that it's a a daring uh, is it very of, uh, of very bold uh, Russian three girls who plunged themselves into Chechnya and you faced with, uh, with, with welcoming Chechens. It, maybe it's a, nice, it's a nice, very kind story that Chechnya is a, a territory of, uh, of injustice uh, and aggression. What, what, as a Russian viewer, I, I will see new and what, how can you appeal to, to me as a uh, Russian viewer considering that you have, you have made a great uh, input. This is a, this is a classical uh, comment on a, uh, of a Russian male viewer. The message is, is straightforward. We want that the di dialogue be reopened. We need that we have to engage that, uh, that Chechnya is a hot button uh, um, region in Russia, but Chechnya has changed dramatically, I have to say. If you compare now and what was then, there's a great difference. Of course, you, you, you know more and you, um, you have a, a broader picture. But for example, uh, an average person, say, in, in, in Kaluga, who, who were told that we have to just to, to kill, to 
to kill terrorists. Uh, and, and, and now we have Kadyrov who says that Allah gives me money, that Chechnya has the biggest uh, uh, mosque, uh, mosque in, uh, in Europe, and this average person in Kaluga and somewhere in Russia has can, just cannot figure it out. It just it doesn't add up. So we have to fill this empty space between these two, two images of a ruined uh, city in, lying in ruins and city boasting fountains, mosque, uh, and lots of money. So we deem that this portal, this platform should, should be actually a forum for people to communicate, to engage with each other. Alexander said that Chechens hate us, uh, but I have to say they welcomed us better. But, uh, but it's, uh, it's a question of dialogue. Uh, we, faced, we were faced with a situation when uh, uh, at the first sight people said, you are Russians, they're just your ugly people. You are, but, but then... Uh, but I would have to say that I, I, a couple of times I drank really heavily with, uh, with um, uh, paratroopers who served in Chechnya, and they asked me, how, how at all can you talk to Chechens? But during the, during the night, as, as we drank further, they changed their opinion, actually, because I, I also I shared my experience, and they, in the end they really said that maybe damn, maybe you have some right. So through dialogue we reach some more common ground and if we can reach out to at least 10, 20 people I'll be more than happy. Okay, uh, Dmitry Kabakov, uh, Moscow. Dmitry Kabakov, Ma Moscow. Uh, Russian, because nevertheless uh, the translation is. Uh, uh, as far as uh, co-production and financing is concerned, I have had some experience on searching co-production. I can say it was a successful experience. But but I understand what were the reasons behind it, so why, why we couldn't find financing. There are an, a number of problems, actually. The, uh, one is that the key uh, financing source is state, is uh, government, and there are no independent funds that can give any grants to produce this. Any Western producer I approached with my project told me, okay, all right, do you have, do you have any money from Russia? Any money? Yes, I said, okay, my personal, from my wallet. No, uh, I mean uh, from some uh, financial backer. No. So that was, that was the end. And I, I, I didn't have money because even, even if I get some grant from a Minister of Culture, which is very doubtful and very unlikely because there are no strict uh, rules, but no one knows the rules how they distribute money. Even if I get any money, I, I have to, to get the film completed and a, at a, by a specific date. Uh, if I fail to do that, I, I'm going to be sanctioned, I'm going to be fined. So I prefer to have, as, as, to, have to do with Russian state as minimum as possible. And so it's, 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 it's impossible. In this, uh, in this way, it's possible to, to conclude a contract between me and the Russian co-production co uh, company. Uh, so these ways are very difficult and have many, many pitfalls uh, and very burdenous, uh, and not the best one. But what we have been talking about just uh, recently during the coffee break, uh, three years ago, roaming streets of St. Petersburg and Moscow, we couldn't, we couldn't uh, just uh, cross the street because no, no one stopped, no, no drive drivers stopped. But now I really see that that, uh, uh, that drivers change their, has, have changed their behavior. So I, it's just an, an example. So I, I feel the need for this discussion, for this um, uh, for this open dialogue, because to live uh, by the rules, it's more comfortable. And I hope that, that the outcome of our discussion, of our dialogue will be more, will be, uh, will be rules changing. It's, it is already happening, but it's, go, it's happening too slow. 
Just, just a short comment on that before we come to you and to you. Okay. Uh, because, and you, okay, fantastic. Um, what you're touching upon is, of course, a clash of cultures or a clash of traditions when you're opening this discussion about Russian filmmakers trying to make international co-productions. One thing is that in, in Western Europe, the tradition, of course, is if you enter a market where people don't know you as a filmmaker, which is what you're talking about. Uh, uh, and just another big problem is in Russia, we don't have any young, energetic uh, producers. That's actually a problem. As a filmmaker, I, I don't have enough energy to push my idea through and to, to work on it as, as a producer. And, and I hope that the new generation will appear uh, of very uh, enthusiastic uh, producers uh, who would also uh, be uh, on the front uh, and will be involved uh, in international activity. I have met uh, really, really few producers from Russia during pitching sessions. We don't have 100 uh, energetic, enthusiastic producers in this room who would be uh, ready to help uh, get me in this process. I don't know how, how can we change uh, the situation here. I'm a, t a teacher at uh, the Institute for Cinematography, and, uh, and I, I, are you a member of our guild? Yes, we have such possibilities. Yes, there are theoretical possibilities, but where exactly? Okay. Okay. What I'm missing, I have told her that uh, to Jane. What we don't have is a professional club, so where I can I can come? We could sit together and discuss something. So if I just open a fa Facebook page and just say uh, faceless mass, uh, faceless uh, something unconcrete, uh, am I expected to to, pu to publish my ideas? Are you, are you just a, a filmmaker or a producer? Yes, I have to be my, my own producer. I don't have a, a extra separate person who would do the uh, uh, producing job. I would really gladly um, uh, charge someone with that. You should talk. Uh, say, uh, two years ago, I, I, I was at a co-production meeting in Leipzig, and only one person was among the participants from Russia. So we don't have this so, this layer of people, this generation of people. So that, but I have to say that this, this kind this kind of work is uh, kicking off systematic in a systematic way only in this year. Probably. Just a second. With these outsiders, look, I can say it's coming. I totally understand your remark. We have some sitting here. Uh, George Belotsov, I've seen him pitched in, in Riga, a wonderful uh, project. Vlad uh, Ketchkovic has been around in these um, international events for the last three or four years. It's coming. Uh, five years ago, we never saw a Russian project in presented in these international financing events. Now they're coming. And I would especially draw your attention to um, IDF, the Institute of Documentary Film that is based in Prague. They are organizing um, both a workshop, which is called Ex Oriente, for film projects um, focusing on Central and Eastern Europe. That's the place you should be if you want to uh, try to enter the world of international financing and co-production. The workshop is a three-part workshop. One is in July, one is in October, and one is in March in Prague where you finally present your project. And you can also apply only for the event in Prague, where you present your project towards a panel of 30, 40, 50 potential financiers. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's a first step. Commissioning editors, sales agents, funds, and so on. Uh, and that's where I, for instance, have met
Vlad Kitkovic the first time. Um, and of course, there's the Baltic Sea Forum in Riga uh, that took place here in the first week of, of, uh, of September, where you could also go. So there are these possibilities. And uh, time for a little commercial again. If you go to the website of EDN, European Documentary Network, you can find a list of all these different uh, events if you're interested. They take place all around the year, and it's a matter of finding the right one. Can I make a small input on this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've been, you know, because we've been working for four years, we've researched all these funding issues extensively, like how uh, a startup or a project from Russia can get funding. And the complication is that even a few years ago, it was a bit easier if you would know where to apply, because Russia was on the third world countries list. So, like, there was IDFA, Bertha Fund, you know, you could apply there. You, like, there was a number of things like this where you could apply. I mean, in the situation when there is no funds in the country and there is no way to approach the state money, like, you know, we, let's say, I don't think in, like, uh, any upcoming future we would have a body like CNC. Like, I really don't see it coming with all the enthusiasm. CNC, the French, yeah, the French state, uh, uh, Film Institute funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, and the... So when, the, when Russia was excluded from this third world countries list, there was a massive funding option taken from us. It's not to complain, but it's just like how uh, the landscape changed. And then I was at the Pitching Forum in Wiesbaden this year in Germany, and the festival was called Go East. It was dedicated to uh, Eastern Europe for all the obvious reasons, you know, post-Soviet bloc, former Yugoslavia. And they are now changing the shift to the Arab world. They think that, you know, Eastern and Central Europe is developed enough to be fine on our own, which I could say, yeah, I can't really agree with that because I also lived in Bosnia and I know the other part of the uh, industry, but, but they feel that the time has come, that they have to pay attention to the Arab world and they want to co-produce with the young filmmakers from the countries of the Arab Spring now, which is fair enough. I mean, they also need attention, but uh, for us, you know, we have to obviously come up with new ways when this part of funding options is taken. I, I can't do, I hear what you're saying, but still, no, it's not, it's not over. It only no, not just, it only just yeah. started <laughs> the, uh, the possibilities of Russian filmmakers to come to outside of Russia. Uh, I came here not to share my experience and to share my memories, but I came for a reason. Our, from 1990s to 93, they, there was St. Petersburg Mafia in the Kremlin, delegated to the Kremlin. And I think roughly there are 150 people of the Russian Mafia, St. Petersburg Mafia, that are now on the federal level. When I was working in the Committee for Culture in 93, on the initiative of Leonid Romankov, who is a friend of Rudolf Nureyev, who's been in the States many times, of course. There was an international conference organized. So Ford Foundation representatives and Acro Foundation representatives were there. There was also Marat Gelman from Moscow. So what were we explained there? That in order to find money, for cultural projects, not only for documentaries, but other projects as well. There has to be state participation, maybe at the minimal level, at least 10% of money should come from government because that gives another status to any talks about the project with the people that maybe will fund the project. So that is called fundraising. <laughs> so we organized a foundation after this conference, the foundation to support cultural initiatives. So we have this foundation, the volume, of money in that foundation is 2% of the city funding. 
So it is our task. It is not a task on the federal level. When I was coming to this conference, I tried to ask one of the deputies in the, in the Duma what is the budget for culture. Unfortunately, unfortunately, he didn't know anything, so I was told just the, the numbers of the city budget. And the city budget is 150 million billion rubles. So even if 1% of that 150 billion rubles is for culture, 1% is 1.5 billion rubles, obviously. So 2% from 1.5 billion rubles is okay for one or two documentaries. And the situation, I think, here in St. Petersburg is the same as Moscow. So the money of the foundation is governed. There is an, um, I don't remember the name, but it's like the Institute of Cultural Initiative. I know a person who is ahead of it. But he is behaving exactly like all the ministries of culture of the Russian Federation. They demonstrate themselves and they demonstrate their friends, their own friends. You know, but we can maybe change the situation. We can break that, but we have to work on that. I follow what's in the media. So when I hear all these stories, you know what beautiful cultural project he supports, but I don't believe that. Thank you. So my name is Olga and I'm from Russia. I am film director, uh, but I think that I will speak Russian because I want yeah, more people to understand me. Um, I think that I'm one of the uh, young filmmakers, documentary filmmakers, that are very enthusiastic, that are very energetic. I want to say that I do not believe the state. I do not believe that the government supports the young people. I am working on the project. I've been working on it for three years. I asked the Ministry of Culture for money. We asked different other government institutions, although I found a producer, so I found people who were interested in my project, but finance-wise it was not good at all. You know, the government gives money to their own people, so you have to know people to get financing. But if you have a desire, if you have a wish, you know, I tried crowdfunding. I estimated 50 days. I still have 22 days to go, and I already found half of the financing that I need. So I must say, people do respond to me. It's just you have to tell in detail to everybody about your project, and you have to believe. Belief is perhaps the most important thing. I would really like the government to pay attention to the young filmmakers, to the young specialists, but it doesn't happen. I graduated from the university here, and when I was writing my diploma, my diploma won a few awards later on, but there is no financing from the university. So it was just like a fight all the time that I've been working. I think it's sad that the situation is like that, and I hope this forum will give us a chance to find many some other financing options than the government. Thank you. But it was my project. Crowdfunding, yes? yes, yes. I have video I can even present. I, I can make presentation for three minutes, no problem. <laughs> what, what is it about? What is your film about? Okay. My, my film is about the first Camp Hill, Camp Hill in Russia. Camp Hill, this is some kind of organization uh, where live handicapped people and uh, normal people. They live together. This is not some kind of internet, and that, that is the difference. Uh, Camp Hill, this is huge European and I think the world. Uh, Mm, de development. But in Russia, there is only one camp hill, and we are such a huge country, and government doesn't support it. That's the thing. There are some uh, pensions from these invalids, and uh, yeah, and that's the thing. But these guys, they live uh, together. They have a, they have cows. They produce milk. They bake a bread. They have, they make a cheese. They have their own. They created their own uh, some kind of world, some kind of village. And of course, there is a hero in 
my movie. Um, and he has a dream. He, he, he likes uh, the songs of Alexander Gradnitsky, that's a very famous uh, Russian singer. And uh, I'm, I, I wrote a postcard with this guy, with my hero, and I, I was on the birthday of Alexander Gradnitsky, and I gave him this postcard. And I will make the connection, uh, that I, I will make them to sing together. This is one of parts. Just the main idea is uh, I would love that this camp hills to be Mm. I would love this campus to be more in, in Russia, and we can do it slowly, slowly, because we are mass media. Yeah, we, we are just part of mass media, but we are. And I think that this is our power, this is our energy, to make people know through the information, through, to the audience. So I think that it's... Good. Thank you. Give her an applause. <laughs> A little, a little short, maybe, this time? Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. I just wanted to explain to all of you, not only to the young people, that we already, in the year 1990 and 91, we could understand what's going to happen the state government, the Soviet Union, was support culture, but because of ideological reasoning. Now there is no ideology. So the government dropped the culture. Maybe something happens. There are some projects such as Brainwash, for example. And they will, of course, the government will continue supporting Brainwash. But all this legal support, all this support for young people, nobody needs that. Nobody needs that. Even the network of cultural institutions in the, in the country is not needed. Museums, no. Theaters, no. Musical institutions, no. Nobody needs that. Okay, we are moving into other... It's very interesting, but remember, it's about film also and financing. Vitaly Rachmanov, I'm a journalist, and I also work in television and television production and cinema production. I have a question to you, dear moderators, and to our foreign colleagues. Here's my question about intellectual theft. There is such term in Russia, intellectual theft. I'm going to give you an example. I think of a topic, I have an idea, and I bring it to my potential buyer, a synopsis and a trailer. Time passes, and they say, no, you know, we're not going to work on your project. Time passes more, and then there is another team, another producer, another filmmaker, and they realize, they implement my work, my topic. How do you resolve these problems? Do, do such problems exist in, say, Sweden, Denmark? Mark or in and the other countries, resolves. and how do you resolve such a situation if it arises? Can you tell me, please? Thank you. I, I'm a, uh, a little bit older than him, so I can say something about it. <laughs> Way back last century, when I started working in the Danish Film Institute, it was called something else at that point, it doesn't matter. Um, filmmakers, if they have ideas, they were doing like this. This is my idea. I'm not going to show or tell anyone about it. Today, and the last 20 years, 15, 20 years, there are pitching sessions all over. People stand up, they pitch their project, they present their project, they are totally open about it. I think personally it's, it's, it's a very good thing. It's, it's an openness that where people are sharing their ideas with other people. If something like that happens, of course there must be examples, but in the big picture in Europe, 
in Denmark, in Sweden, no problem. Even countries, the Baltic countries, in Latvia, maybe also with you in Lithuania, people, when they have projects, they are obliged to pitch it publicly to the film funds and so on. So people come and they pitch the project publicly so everybody knows what the other one is doing. Is it democratic? Maybe. Is it a good idea? I think it's a good idea. Do the films become better from these pitching sessions? I will leave that question in the air. Is that an answer? Are there any other? Yeah. We have another discussion. Um, Sergei, if you are talk are you raising a question? Okay, right now. Question about financing. What do you want to know? Parovsky. Where did you find money? And is the project profitable? Was it a cultural project? Maybe if there is no money back, if there is no happiness in the end, maybe it's at least the promotion of culture, children, some new ways, some new ways to attract children to culture? Uh, we funded the project uh, fully, so it oh, it um, is funded by uh, M is better. Better? MDM. It's a German fund, uh, the European Media Funding, Interactive Media uh, select, uh, Section, and uh, Media Board, Berlin Brandenburg. Uh, we also went into with our own investment of the company, but it was fully funded, and the business model was that it is a paid app. But uh, we not expect that we get that much money back. Uh, I think right now we have the money back for having maybe a, a fifth language, uh, like a translation for this. And um, what was the, uh, the other part of the question? Like the no. We expect that, uh, as it was the, or as, it, as it is, the Wagner year, that we could get uh, ministry funding or cultural funding, as it, for example, gets an opera or something. But we haven't got anything. No. How do you financially manage as a company? Because you just said earlier on that the transmedia and crossmedia section doesn't bring the income. So does the income come from the traditional filmmaking? That's like, so how is the business model of the production company works? No, no, it's fully funded. So the project itself is funded as uh, the film production uh, was funded. The cross media has three parts. So we, for the book, for the graphic novel book, we uh, had a partner, the publisher Knesebeck in Germany, uh, who funded the, or who paid for the book. Then, uh, because of the film, we also paid the artist. So the artist who did the animations was paid f over the film, but also we also used it for the graphic novel as well as for the the app, and uh, the, the film was separately funded by a TV channel Arte and several uh, funding stations, and the app was, was fully funded. How much so did you pay for the music? We paid for the music, for the, for the app or for the film? The whole thing. Well, it's separately, so we, it's really, it, it is a cross-media project, but when you look in the details of the... <laughs> Yeah, the money is cross media too. So, if if one part is away, then you still can do the film. You can still publish the book. Um, that's how we we raised this project. The, 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 the music we paid, I think it was something thousand five hundred euros for the license to use it on this platform but it was also a problem uh, so we had to buy the music separately for the film as well as separately for the for the app the business model of the production company I'm still curious yeah. um, um, we have this uh, magazine Eins Weiter in Cologne we have four offices uh, we raise money for uh, for each film production and of course we always count okay what does the company need to survive so it is always part of the, 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 the money we ask for 
to think, okay, what's the next step, what's the next project? And when we, we have a workflow, like when we are in production with a project, we already have something in the pipeline. And we not always work on one project. We have five, seven, eight projects at, at, at one time. Basically, when you apply for funding, you include the salary for everybody involved sure. in, in the funding. Yeah. Okay, Colburn. I would just like to comment on uh, the problems that are quite obvious uh, in the audience, uh, the problems that you have trying to find uh, fundings uh, here in Russia. As a president for the Federation of Artists in Iceland and uh, also uh, for the European Council of Artists, I think I have just one key word for you that might be useful, uh, and that is networking. I don't think you should give up getting government funds. I think you have to network within your own groups and try to unite with all the other artists that are working out there and need funding for their projects, be it uh, an innovative exhibition, be it uh, a theatre project or a musical project or whatever. Try to make networks with all the, those people and uh, make up a strategy for the government and tell the government how you want to see official funding in Russia develop. And there is one key word that works well with governments, at least in the European Union, and that is creative industries. Politicians understand industries. That's something has, that has to do with economy. And convince them that your industry is also positive for the economy, make their strategy, tell them how many funds they need to uh, need to uh, raise and, or, 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 or uh, found, and how the application system should be, how the regulations uh, uh, should be for each fund, and work on it together. Networking, so more networking, and still more networking. Uh, question to the audience, but you know, uh, short one, but maybe long answers, okay. Okay. So I would be interested, who is a freelancer or filmmaker in this audience? Okay, so uh, is there someone from a production company who is a producer? Okay, so the, the, the golden rule also in Germany is uh, when you're a freelancer, when you're a filmmaker, you need to find a producer so that the company applies for the funding. This is really important because if you're alone, you, you, you're standing in front of closed doors. So you have, all have to go to him. <laughs> As they say in the Liverpool Football Club, never walk alone. We have to stop now. Can I just say that come back at 3 o'clock, please? We will have Maria from Norway, Grigori from Moscow to talk, and we will also invite you to come up, come and present your project, come and ask your questions, uh, so we can have a happy ending of this conference. We were in the beginning saying that we don't want any crying. I don't think you've been crying. You've been complaining a little about the situation. Is that right? Okay, have a nice lunch. Which is quite understandable.